Farragona had asked if I would do a Perkins overview. And I thought that was a good idea because we all hear about Perkins. All of us, I think most everybody in this room is CTE. I know we're healthcare, business and engineering technology. Uh, we got Charlie and, and, and uh, Shager. Shager over here and Justin in the back, but they partner with us a lot in a lot of different areas. So I think it's good for them to, to be here as well. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're just going to have a conversation. We're going to talk about some background on Perkins, why we do what we do, and uh, you know what it means to career and technical education. Has everybody here heard of Perkins? Anybody not heard of it? Okay. Except for Chris. Chris has not heard of it. Uh, actually, the first bill that was passed by the legislature to support vocational education was passed in 1917. And there's been variations of that throughout the years, but in 1984, the Carl D. Perkins Act was passed. And that's what we call Perkins One. Can anybody tell me how many versions of Perkins we've had? What are we on now? Five. Five, Perkins Five, that's right. Uh, but the primary goal of Perkins, come on in David primary goal of Perkins <clears throat> is to support career and technical education and it mandates that we provide academic and technical training for students to prepare them for jobs out in the workforce. So it is the primary funding source for career and technical education for all programs nationwide both secondary and post-secondary. So high schools get money through Perkins and colleges get money through Perkins. Now the version we're on now, Perkins 5, that was signed into law on uh, July 31st, 2018 by President Trump. It's called the Strengthening Career and Technical Education for the 21st Century Act, otherwise known as Perkins 5. And whenever that happened, we had to write a new state plan. And I was on the uh, Perkins Task Force, Force Committee that met with uh, Mississippi Department of education and uh, some of our secondary partners and then some of our other community college partners and the Mississippi Community College Board. We came together over the span of a year and met and wrote a new state plan for Perkins 5. Some key fe features of Perkins. Uh, the allocation formula is based on population. So the states with higher population naturally get more money than the states with less population. The distribution allocation that goes to each state has to be 85% distributed at the local level. So the amount of funds we get in Mississippi, 85% of that has to come directly to the community colleges and the secondary schools, the vocational centers. The state has a flexibility deciding how that is allocated, the split. So in other words, uh, MDE, who receives that money through the federal government, they decide basically how that split between secondary and post-secondary uh, is done. And of course, when we wrote Perkins 5, we didn't know that MDE was planning to, to change that split and allocation until we got ready to see the final bill. And they came out and they said, okay, we're gonna change the allocation between secondary and post-secondary. So it went from 51.49, I think it was, to right now 57% goes to secondary and 43% goes to post-secondary or to the colleges. So basically that caused all of the 15 colleges to take a big cut in Perkins funding. Of course, another uh, feature is that the state is required to develop and implement CTE programs of study. That's at the secondary and post-secondary level. Uh, all of the, the secondary schools, they, they have criteria and a curriculum that they have to follow so that they're all teaching the same things and of course we're that way too. The Mississippi Community College Board, you know all of our programs we meet every five years to do a revision of our curricula and to make sure that the state is teaching the program, teaching the same classes in each program of study. And then of course states must implement program improvement strategies <clears throat> if we don't meet certain Perkins performance criteria and uh, essentially that means you know if, if we don't meet the levels that we're supposed to meet then we have to uh, provide a plan of how we're going to achieve that in the future. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Some of the changes with Perkins 5 
Uh, I would say the biggest change is it requires a needs assessment, and that is y'all come on in. Yeah, we decided to join. You probably heard uh, when we get ready to work on Perkins and Lori asks for information, we do what's called a local plan ap application because we're considered grantees of these Perkins funds. This federal, it's a federal grant is what it is. And uh, one of the biggest changes with our local plan application is that we are required to do a needs assessment every two years now, and that is in cooperation with other agencies. And <coughs> so coming up, on uh, January 27th, we're going to be meeting at the Belden Center, and we'll meet with uh, Itawamba Northwest. We'll discuss a regional plan needs assessment, and then we will break into groups with uh, our secondary partners for, for our district, each college will, and we'll develop a local plan needs assessment. And that's coming up on January 7th. So, so those are some things that we're already working on and preparing for. Uh, also in the local application, there was more emphasis put on special population services, work-based learning. You know, we've really uh, done a lot with the Tiger Apprenticeship over the last few years. We've tried to grow that. We've implemented work-based learning classes in a lot of your curriculums in your programs of study. And also the state sets targets for <laughs> performance accountability measures. So in other words, the federal government through this bill tells us what criteria that they're gonna look at but the state sets those levels for us that we have to achieve. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, just an overview of the budget, how the Perkins budget works. About $1.1 billion is split between the 50 states. Mississippi gets about $14 million of that. And of that $14 million, 15% comes right off the top to go towards state administration and leadership. And then the 85% that's left 7% is put in reserve. Secondary puts that in reserve. We don't have that. It's, it's not post-secondary. It's, it's just the secondary schools get that reserve. And then the 57 and 43%, you can see there, uh, the 43% that the 15 community colleges get is about $4.8 million. And then that is divided amongst the 15 community colleges. At Northeast, we generally get around $200,000 in Perkins. Now that goes up and down every year. Uh, Lori can tell you we took a huge hit when they changed that allocation formula. When they bumped secondary up to 47% and us to 43%, it really hurt us. Set based on enrollment. That's what I was about to show you. It is. Excuse me, 50 states split $1 billion. That's right. That's it. Yep, $1.1 billion. To and educate, that, that is based to on educate the builders of our country for career technical education. Wow. That's right. So, and, and that's another thing. You know, Perkins is uh, <coughs> career and technical education. You cannot spend Perkins funds on anything that is not directly re related to training students <coughs> in career and technical educa education programs. So, <coughs> health sciences. Then we would go to health sciences. CT just CT. Just CT has to be specific to CT. Well, health sciences are considered CT. Yeah, yeah, health sciences. I'm sorry, I was thinking about. Um, I, I was thinking. I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. Health sciences <coughs> are all of the programs are CT or Perkins except for ADN. That's right. That's right. Who's the 15 percent of the state getting that money? The administrator. It's mostly MDE. Administrative yeah, salaries. Salaries. <laughs> salaries. Yeah. 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 Administrative salaries, mostly. Yeah. What's the cut right there? Is the cut? Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. Well, of I have an analogy for you. When you get an arts grant through Mississippi, you can you can spend your money on talent, bringing people in, but you can't get equipment, you can't get stuff, you can't get lights and sets and stuff. So it's got to be on talent, lecturers, speakers, yeah. actors. Hey, I'm sorry, Justin, when you asked that. I, a lot of people say that CTE and health science. Well, health science is CTE. Mm -hmm. We have the two different divisions, business and engineering technology and health science, but it's all career and technical education. But, and none of it goes towards workforce. Workforce no. comes from- That's right. Mm -hmm. It's all goes towards credit programs and training. Right. Um, you asked about the how, how we are determined how much each community college receives in the state <laughs> of that 4.8 million. It's based on the number of Pell Grant recipients we have in career and technical education programs. And VIA, which is Bureau of Indian Affairs, 
we don't often have any of those students. I think Lori said we had one last year maybe. Uh, but they look at the number we have here at Northeast and they divide that by the total number <coughs> that the state has for all the colleges. And that's how they determine how much each school gets. So <clears throat> theoretically, a school that is, uh, has more, is in a more of an economically depressed area would probably receive more in Pell Grants funds based on the size of the college. Okay. The needs assessment, I mentioned that, uh, that we have coming up January 27th. What we do is, you know, we meet with the three colleges. We'll meet with the Mississippi Community College Board and MDE representatives. We'll develop a regional <coughs> plan. Then we'll break into smaller groups. Uh, Dr. Barragona and uh, Ms. Davis and I will be going to that and we'll meet with all of our career and technical centers and develop a local plan. Once we get this information, we'll have to come back. Lori and I will work on that and we'll have to put it into a local plan application that's submitted to the Mississippi Department of Education to continue to get that grant. As I said, we do this every, every two years. There's a focus on high skill, high wage, in demand industry sectors. So we have to show that we're working with our secondary partners with the programs they have that there's a need for those and that those relate to what we're teaching here at Northeast, okay? And that what we're teaching, there's a demand for. So that's the purpose of the needs assessment and the getting together as a group to discuss. As I said, uh, Perkins, one of, the, <clears throat> one of the criteria for that is that the state develops uh, programs of study that incorporate these different areas. They have to be, uh, meet challenging state academic standards they have to address technical knowledge and skills, including employability skills. They uh, have to align, of course, with the needs of industries in the state and, and more specifically in our region. They are required to progress from general to specific. So they start out more generalized and by the time a student graduates, they're, they're supposed to be taking more specific classes related to their program of study. They have multiple entry and exit points and of course it culminates in the attainment of some type of post-secondary credential. That could be a certificate or an Associate of Applied Science. Some requirements, uh, of course, industry partnerships, that's big. We have to work with our industries because if we're not uh, working closely with our industries, how do we know that we're preparing students for what they need? Work-based learning opportunities, I mentioned, that's been uh, more emphasis on that with Perkins 5. Special population services, you know, we do a survey every fall that goes out to the students. They fill out the survey to see if we can identify which students fall into those categories. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Professional development is required for faculty and staff. Uh, you know, when we went through our Perkins audit a couple of years ago, there is a whole section on professional development where we have to show that all of our faculty are receiving professional development. Now that can be program specific industry specific, or it can be things like we're doing today. This counts towards professional development as well. Advisory committees are required. I know all of you are familiar with that. You all have your own advisory committees. And I've got a little section we'll talk more specifically about that. And there are specific purchasing requirements with Perkins. You know, when Lori says, okay, we need to know uh, what, what you need because we're gonna start spending Perkins funds there are certain requirements that we have to follow, and most of y'all are probably familiar with that. Now, as I said, Perkins money can only be spent on things directly related to career technical education for our students, nothing else. Generally at Northeast, we spend Perkins money in three areas. We have some uh, special population support staff. Ms. Hastings here, she teaches mathematics class specifically for career and technical education students, CTE students. We used to have Ms. Goodson who taught uh, English the same way. And we also have Leanne Stewart who is our disabilities coordinator uh, slash special populations coordinator. Another category is software or instructional materials. And uh, we, we generally spend quite a bit on software through Perkins per to uh, operate our programs and uh, help teach students some of the things that, that, that we can only do with certain required softwares. That's $22,000 a year, something like that we spend on software. And then of course the, the last and one of the most important is, is equipment. We buy equipment with Perkins and 
a lot of times it's the only way we can ever afford to buy equipment. So, you know, we what we do is we rotate um, through programs. Generally, I know in our division, I'm not sure how much Davis does, we try to look at priority, who's received uh, equipment last year or in the last few years, and we try to make sure that's dispersed equally throughout the different programs. But of course, you know, if a need pops up, if somebody has a piece of equipment that's broken, then we have to take that opportunity to, to purchase that through Perkins. Some of the guidelines, and Chris may want to add something on this, but uh, a Perkins guideline is that each individual item that we purchase has to be $500 at least. So we can't buy RAM for a computer that's $150 a piece, even if the total order's $10,000. Each item has to be $500. There is an exceptions list. That's right. What <coughs> What are some of the things in the exceptions like printers, list? printers, um, TVs. We, it, it hadn't been updated in so long. Like, it was, like, typewriters. Like, from the 90s. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, it was more like from the 80s. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> so, what's on there. Basically, if there's something like that mm -hmm. that you really need, just let check with us, and we'll see if it's on the exceptions list. Jason, I think your 3500 is now $10,000. Has it gone off ten thousand? A couple of years ago. Okay. Or well, I had, year. I had checked with Amber. I thought maybe <coughs> did, maybe did. Anyway, we've we'll, been using we'll, thirty five hundred. We'll, we're safe. It's actually you're safe doing that. That's the state right. State level is five thousand. <laughs> so yeah. anything over five, you've got to anyway. Even right. with Perkins money, um, and, and it's not a bad practice to do that anyway. It's not. Bad. Well, basically what we're talking about, we've always used 3,500 for federal monies. Chris thinks that level's gone up, but right now we're still <laughs> doing that. I mean, it, it, I just think it's good practice if we can do that. You know, if you if you need a piece of equipment that's 3,500 or more, we like for you to get two, two quotes on it. And then of course, if it's $50,000 or more, the college must advertise for bids. Can you tell them about how we do that, General Chris? Yeah, first it has to go to the board for approval to, to authorize President Ford to advertise for bids. And then it, it, there's different requirements for equipment versus construction, but I think equipment has to run in the paper for two weeks, and then you can open bids seven days after that. Then you calculate all the bids. Well, for equipment now, we actually have to do reverse auction. So um, we advertise for qualifications for bid for bidders. Then we do a reverse auction online, and bidders actually do like instead of like you know on eBay you auction and bid goes up. Well, vendors bid lower prices if they want to get it. So that's how the equipment auction works now. Um, and, and the, the key thing is those bidders bid against each other and they can see in real time um, when they're doing that auction just like you can on eBay if somebody else bids and then if there's a, if they want to put in a lower bid but you, you generally put it in a time frame we don't run into this a lot um, now you know we did a lot of purchasing of larger items with the COVID money but we were under an emergency declaration so all we required was two quotes uh, on most of that stuff but anyway there's um i don't want to get into all the details about the equipment right. but that's basically how it is on the advertising for bids okay thank you chris perkins reported now i mentioned you know lori comes and she brings all of you as instructors and program directors she'll bring you a sheet that you have to fill out and report on your students reporting is based on july the first of one year to june the 30th of the next year Generally, uh, we're looking at students. So this past fall of 21, we were looking at students from July 1st of 20 that graduated in May of, of 21. Now, when we talk about uh, students that are no longer in the program or leavers, then we're looking at the previous year. They would not be reported in that cycle. But we'll talk a little bit more about that. One thing to note is once a student is a CTE concentrator, we have to follow them as long as they're at Northeast. <clears throat> Doesn't matter what program they change to or if they go to academic or whatever, we have to keep up with them. Categories, uh, when we look to start our reporting, there are three levels. Uh, the first level is a participant, second level is a concentrator, and level three is a lever. And we'll talk about what each one of those are. A participant basically is an individual who has completed one course of study 
in a specific CTE program. That's a participant. A concentrator is a student who has completed or earned 12 credits in one program of study, okay? So, for instance, if we had a student, we had a lot of this this past summer, a student uh, sign up to take Microsoft Excel, okay? They've never had a CTE class. They sign up as business management technology. They take an Excel class, and then that's all they do. They never come back, you know, in the fall. They don't continue with the program. What would that student be considered? A participant. They took that one course. But if that student came in the fall, took a full load, 12 hours or more, in business management technology, they would then be considered a concentrator, right? So once they become a concentrator, that's when we have to keep up with them. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. We also have completers. Basically, a completer is a concentrator that earns a industry-recognized credential. So for us, that's gonna be generally a, a certificate or an associate degree. And then we have <coughs> leavers. And basically, a leaver is a previous year concentrator who is no longer in the program when we start to do our, when we do our reporting. Okay. With uh, our performance indicators, with Perkins five, we have three. That that has decreased. We used to have five with Perkins four. Now we only have three. These are the main indicators that we look at. Now there are some other uh, performance areas that the state looks at, but as far as federal Perkins dollars, there's only three. The first one is retention and placement. Basically, this is the percentage of concentrators who are placed or retain employment. Now the way we get that figure is we look at level three or levers of the program. So once they're a concentrator and we look back at that, that the year, our reporting year, and they were the year before a concentrator, but they're no longer in the program, we have to report where they are, basically. Right, Lori's giving me a funny look, so if I say something wrong now, speak <laughs> up. But we look at, you know, basically, are they placed, do they retain employment if they were, you know, employed when they were in school, or were they placed in, in employment after they were a concentrator, after they left the program? They can also continue post-secondary education, uh, advanced training, military service. Uh, there's several different options that we can report on that they might have gone into. Anything specific? Well, you know, we talked about yesterday, we don't, we can't, can't continue education anymore. It's not a negative, but it's not a positive either. Continue, if they're out of the program and they continue their education somewhere, it's just kind of a, a neutral reporting. What do you do if you can't find them? That's a lot. <sighs> Yeah, that happens. Unknown. Yeah, it's unknown. Right. Yeah, but but <laughs> it's y'all. It, it's important that that we focus on these three indicators because this is how we're graded for our Perkins dollars, Perkins Perkins wise, and uh, retention and placement. That's that's a huge one because if we're not if we're not placing our students, what are we doing? What are we here for? We're here to get them jobs. Second one is, did they earn a recognized post-secondary credential? That's 2P2. And that means, did they get a certificate or did they graduate with an associate degree, basically? We look at that the same way. We look at level three students, the leavers that were concentrators the year before. If they were in the program one year and then the year we report they're gone, did they get a credential? And then the last one, and this is the one that we normally don't meet, and we're not the only school. Most schools across the state don't meet it. And that is non-traditional program enrollment. <clears throat> so basically, we look at the number of concentrators that are in a particular program and see how many non-traditionals we have. Y'all know what we mean by non-traditional. We're talking about gender. Uh, non-traditionals generally uh, it is considered less than 25% of that gender works in a specific occupation. So industrial maintenance, for instance. Females would be non-traditional in that. Some of the healthcare programs, males would be non-traditional in that. Any questions about that? <clears throat> those are our three criteria, so it's important to focus on those. You know, I, I talked about a concentrator being 12 credits. That's why it's important we get students in the right program path. You know, they take a class, that's fine, but once they hit that 12-hour mark, 
that's when they start counting for us and we have to report on them. That's when it gets really important. Is there a goal for non-traditional gender? Yes. The states set I those levels. It's so usually like around seven or eight percent, something like that. Are older students considered non-traditional? Not talking about only gender. Here. They they are non-traditional, but this is to only gender for Perkins. So how do you track your students while they're still here before they graduate? If they change a the program, if they get out of CTE altogether, or, or what if they just leave? The instructor, out? program instructors track them. Okay. Yeah. So it's mainly by who's teaching, because y'all are just seeing them so many times. <clears throat> That's right. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. What are special populations? We've talked about that. What categories do, do, does a student fall into that would make them considered special populations? Individuals with disabilities, uh, individuals from economically disadvantaged families, low income, uh, individuals preparing, preparing for non-traditional fields, so those are special populations, single parents, uh, ESL students, English as second language, and these red ones, these are new with Perkins 5. So they, well now we include out of workforce individuals or dislocated workers, homeless individuals, youth who are in or were in foster care, and also youth who have a parent that's in the military. So, you know, when we do the, the special population survey <laughs> every fall, they, we send that out. Sometimes we do it physically, and then we, there's been times where we put it into the uh, orientation of the college life course. But this is why we do this, do that, because we have to document the number of special population students. Leanne Stewart keeps up with that. And then, you know, if they have special needs, we can, we can give them some special attention that way. I want to talk a little bit about Perkins uh, advisory boards. Why do we have advisory boards? Anybody? Well, one reason Perkins requires it. To give input from business and industry on what our students need. That's right. That's right. So, an advisory board is a committee, it's a group of professionals. Uh, that help educators to design and implement career and technical education programs. It's made up of individuals with experience or expertise in the field. Who should we have on our committees? Who do y'all have on your advisory committees? Employers. Managers, Basically, yeah. That's right. Yep. So people that work in industry for the field, you're training students to join, right? Employers in the area, uh, another thing, another possibility are individuals that belong to certain professional groups like the Mississippi Board of Contractors, uh, Joey for construction engineering. Equipment vendors, that's a possibility. And it's very important to have CTE secondary instructors involved in our advisory committees. Likewise, it's important for us to be a part of their committees because we need that input between uh, secondary and, and post-secondary. We need that communication. So I urge you, if you don't have your secondary partners that teach something related to what you teach, you need to get them on your advisory committee. And of course, 51%, uh, at least 51% should come from business and industry. So you can have some of these other people on your advisory board, but the majority needs to be made up from industry professionals. How do you look uh, at the selection criteria? How do you select members? It needs to be somebody that has expertise in the field, like we said. They need to be willing to support the college and its programs, and they also need to be willing to commit time and effort. How many times have you had somebody on your advisory committee that won't show up for meetings, they won't, sit on a phone call with you or a Zoom call, they don't do you any good. So you need to try to find people that are interested in your program and supporting the college as a whole and your programs and are, they're willing to commit time and effort. So how do advisory committees benefit your programs? What are some ways? Crystal said, you know, that they provide input, <coughs> training programs. It's the state the biggest. Huh? That's right. They have, that's that's a big one, Jonathan. They have to be when we do curriculum revisions. We have to have a certain amount of employers that participate, or we can't do the revision. It's a requirement. 
and we get our advisory committee members to do that. And it's something y'all probably already know, but I can just tell y'all this from being on the instruction council with Jason. Y'all have changes in y'all's curriculum all the time. It, that very rarely happens on the academic side. It doesn't, I don't, you usually bring one every single instruction council meeting. Just we may do one yeah. every couple of months. Yeah, and we'll talk about that process just a little bit. I'm gonna have to speed up. I don't wanna keep it too long. Uh, but we'll we'll talk about that a little bit, Justin. He's right. Of course, they ensure our relevant our, our programs are relevant and up to date. They can assess our equipment, make sure equipment we're using meet industry standards. They provide work-based learning experiences for learners. So, you know, our clinicals, our Tiger apprenticeship, they they help us with that. They advocate. They advocate in the community and the legislators for our programs. And they assist with uh, placement of program completers as well. So to talk about the curriculum just a little bit, I wanted to briefly go through that and show you how to access your curriculum. If you're not familiar how to go to the state website, you go to the Community College Board website, which is mccb.edu. This is the main page. Click on View Offices. Then you would go uh, to Curriculum and Instruction and Assessment. Curriculum, they make you jump through some hoops to get there. And then finally, the curriculum download page. Now, once you click on that, it's gonna bring up all of the career <laughs> clusters. They've changed this in the last year or two. You go under different career clusters to find your program of study. <clears throat> so, uh, manufacturing, you know, industrial maintenance, precision machining, uh, manufacturing will be under that. Then when you pull up your uh, curriculum, it's gonna look something like this. Are y'all familiar with this? Who can tell me uh, what the 15, 30, 45, and 60 criteria means that we've developed at the state level? State College Board develops all their curriculum around that, 15, 30, 45, and 60. Do y'all know what that means? No. Is it certifications? No. After 15? It's part of it, yep. Uh, yeah. That's right. Get That's right. Included. That's right. So they've developed all of the curriculum to be where you can get a 15 hour, or I say all, not all, but most, where you can get a 15 hour certificate. Now we don't do that at Northeast. Our industry partners tell us that a 15 hour certificate is not worth a lot. So we don't do that. We do some 30 hour certificates, which are called career certificates. We do some 45 hour certificates, which are called technical certificates. And then of course the 60 is the associate degree. 60 and above. Okay. So you can see here, this is business uh, accounting technology, I think that I pulled up. You have your first 30 hours of your required, of course 15, and then the 15 is gonna be a part of this 30, so I just wanna focus on that. Your first 30 hours, these are classes that are required. This is in the state curriculum, so this has to be in our Northeast curriculum. Now of this 30, they're gonna allow about 25% for us to determine at the local level. So you'll see down here it says, instructor improved technical electives, 12 or nine hours. So those are, those are electives that we decide to put in at the local level. The next 15 hours are gonna be your technical certificate hours. So if we offer a technical certificate, we're gonna offer these extra 15 hours. There again, you'll see there's six hours of instructor approved technical electives in that. So just to give you, an, uh, for instance, in our division, business and engineering, a career certificate would be anything in BOT. That's a one year certificate, that's 30 hours. When a student gets a certificate, they, they complete that one year, that's career certificate. We offer some two year certificates, automotive, collision, HVAC, some of those programs. The two year certificate includes all of those 45 hours of technical classes. So that's the 30 plus the 15. And then of course we have associate degree. That's 30 plus 15 plus the 15 hours of academic classes. Any questions about that? Okay. Those are the academic classes listed in each curriculum. Okay, uh, last thing I wanted to cover was something that Justin talked about, the curriculum change process, and we do that a lot in CTE. 
And there's several different reasons why we do that. Uh, first of all is, you know, every five years we go through a curriculum rewrite with each program. And that's where instructors that are, that are teaching that program meet together with employers, advisory committee members, and staff from MCCB. We all come together to see what needs to be changed. How do we need to update that curriculum? That generally happens every five years. Sometimes they get off track on that. Sometimes they're late, sometimes they're a little early, but generally it's around five <coughs> years. So if changes are made at the state level, what's the next step? Well, we discuss it with our advisory committees. We always discuss any changes with our advisory committees. It's important that we do that and we get it in our minutes. Lori will remind you of that. Is that right, Lori? Yes, sir. Yeah. It's important to document that in your minutes. If you have changes to your program, meet with your advisory committee and document it in your minutes. Next step, if you want to change something, advisory committee approves it, discuss it with your division head. Step after that is we would bring it to uh, the division to vote on it at the division level. If it's approved at that level, then the division head brings it to instruction council. And that's what Justin was talking about. Almost every month I have some to change. So I'll bring you know a change to instruction council. Instruction council will vote on it at that level. If it's approved there, it goes to the board of trustees. They vote on it at that level. If it's approved there, then the catalog is changed. Curriculum, you know, Northeast, your curriculum in the catalog at that level. Anybody have any questions about that? Pretty straightforward. Okay. That's about all I have to cover on here. Uh, does anybody have any specific questions? Something that I didn't talk about or you'd like to know? Jason, what yeah. are our three largest Northeast industry partners? Three largest industry partners. Three largest partners. industry partners. Mm -hmm. Northeast. That'd be hard to say. You know, it, uh, Workforce, they have a lot of industry partners. We have industry partners and advisory committees. Uh, Caterpillar is a big industry partner oh, for right. us. Uh, guys, help me out here. Jeff? Ashley Furniture. Ashley Furniture is right. a huge one. MDOT. MDOT. APMM. 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 New, New Way Trucking, you know, is mm -hmm. one here that we work a lot with. Right. Tag uh, Industries, Tri-State Truck Centers, Summit Truck Centers. And then, of course, all of our, our in the healthcare industry, you're looking at all of our hospitals. All right. So, all right. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. What else, guys? We have more than just this area, too. I got a lot of industry in Tennessee, Alabama. Uh, I'm feeding a lot of kids. Doesn't areas. that conflict with the state uh, funding overseers? I mean, we don't get nothing. I don't get nothing back from the state, but I get, I mean, they'll donate stuff to the program or whatever because we build a partnership with All right. Them. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we have people on our advisory committee from Lee County and counties outside of our district. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? Any other questions? Lord, is there anything that we need to cover that we are not talked about? Anything that y'all would like to know? So I just want to ask y'all this, because we've got a bunch of different people in here. The Bachelor of, Bachelor of Applied Science is starting to pop up to four-year institutions. Do y'all value that? Do y'all see that as a, as a valuable thing for y'all's students? Yeah. Depends yes. on the program. Yes. I'm glad you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Everybody's aware that, that that's a new trend. Mississippi State offers a Bachelor of Applied Science. The W mm -hmm. does. A lot of our healthcare students are going to get that at the W. Mm -hmm. uh, Southern Miss has offered one for quite a while. And basically, UNA. 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 Yeah, so basically, that, that means the Bachelor of Applied Science, they accept all of our technical hours. Most of the time, it's up to 60 hours. Well, music so, yeah. well, UNA, so, but it's... It's an interdisciplinary study. In in, so how many of the technical credits will they have? I think it's 60. Oh, 60. 60. I think it's 60. I think it's 60. I think it's 60. I mean, like, for me, they're going to give you the same money if you got a doctor or if you got a social Yeah. yeah. So, um, would it be valuable to y'all if we had somebody from Mississippi State that is over those programs to come talk to us? Do you think? Yeah. Would you be interested in that? I'd like to know myself. I try to get in touch with them to find out more information. I mean, it's a great opportunity for our students. Previously, you know, our degrees, of course, health, 
health science was not always that way, but a lot of our other uh, business and engineering, they were t pretty much terminal. You had to start over when you started a bachelor's degree. This way you could transfer those hours and just keep trucking. All right, well, if there's nothing else, thank y'all for thank coming. You,